class, welcome back to our last unit set of notes here, unit 7. We'll be focusing on atmospheric pollution in this unit. Today we'll begin with primary air pollution and uh, begin our discussion of stratospheric ozone as well as uh, the depletion of that stratospheric ozone layer, the process and how that occurs. Uh, our introduction to air pollution essentially revolves around uh, these main concepts here, uh, CO2, indoor air pollutants, noise pollution, and um, just general air pollution facts. To begin our discussion, we'll be talking about primary air pollutants. Uh, this really refers to pollutants that are emitted directly from a source, uh, particularly burning of fossil fuels would be kind of generalized here as our reason for uh, the majority of these uh, items that, that we'll be talking about today. Um, Combustion of fossil fuels does a lot of things besides releasing primary air pollutants. These primary air pollutants also react with each other uh, and heat and sunlight to form secondary air pollutants. Uh, they also create other problems like acid rain in addition to their contribution towards uh, a warming climate. So there are many reasons we need to reduce these air pollutants, but first we need to understand exactly what their sources are. So combustion of fossil fuels can lead to nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide. There's two groups here, a little graph over on the side. Uh, what I really just wanted to point out to you is like sulfur dioxide here, the number one source is electric utilities currently. All right, so this is the number one SO2. And this is from coal burning, All right? Uh, this is our electric utility primary um, fuel, and that's where that source is coming from. Nitrogen oxides, we hop over here, the primary reason nitrogen oxides exist is from our cars, our vehicles that we drive. So this is combustion of gasoline versus combustion of coal, um, and that's why we get our, the majority of our nitrogen oxides from in the environment. Uh, we can continue to move down the list, but before we do that, we want to kind of highlight um, some of the the other issues with these things too, and the idea that yes, we burn coal, um, and this is one of those things that is uh, particularly harmful for uh, causing acid rain, and we'll get into that later. Um, but it can also be a respiratory irritant. Nitrogen oxides, again, could be a respiratory irritant, and again, can cause issues with uh, the formation of acid rain. We start looking at things like mercury and lead. These are our heavy metals. All right, so we've discussed their impact as a pollutant in aquatic ecosystems, and now we'll start looking at um, kind of how they affect, in addition to human health, but also how they get into um, uh, the environment as well. So mercury and lead, burning of coal can be another result of that, a burning of fossil fuels, but coal in particular, um, that's how they can get into the environment. Uh, mercury can be a powerful neurotoxin and can affect our nervous system. Uh, lead can really be uh, in the same camp there, um, and these things can get into the environment and persist for a long period of time. Carbon dioxide was one of the main pollutants that we've discussed so far when we talk about air pollution and climate change. Um, certainly there are natural sources as well, uh, but burning fossil fuels is going to enhance how much carbon dioxide is present in the environment. Um, but yeah, the climate change link and the warming planet is our greatest concern with CO2. Uh, the hydrocarbons, we discuss hydrocarbons a in a little more detail later, uh, but understand that uh, these are non-methane hydrocarbons that are present um, as a result of incomplete combustion of fossil fuels at times or release of more volatile kind of uh, vapors. Uh, particulate matter and uh, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide are the last ones. Uh, particulate matter kind of refers to um, the, the particles that are left behind. This is particles in the air uh, from combustion of things like uh, coal and oil and natural gas, but um, also something like diesel, like not just gas, but diesel itself is, is a little more dirty and uh, can release this kind of soot into the environment. There are two types of particulate matter, PM10, which is smaller than 10 micrometers, and PM 2.5, which is smaller than, or 2.5 or less uh, micrometers uh, large, which is pretty small. Uh, these are really bad for respiratory systems, cause premature uh, death and lung issues. Now, carbon monoxide will be discussed a little later, um, and indoor air pollutants, but understand 
that this is a really particularly dangerous um, thing to breathe in because it's an asphyxiant and can cause um, breathing problems. Moving on to indoor air pollutants, this is where we're going to focus on a couple of those ones mentioned earlier, um, particularly the uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, the carbon monoxide, incomplete combustion of gas, uh, usually a faulty gas furnace or heater, can be the result of carbon monoxide in a home. Um, it's it's uh, odorless, and it can lead to this unconsciousness and death occurring if it's if it's breathed in for too long. Um, so that's why it's important to have carbon monoxide detectors in your home, uh, because if you have a gas furnace, this is something that could happen uh, as a result of, of a faulty furnace. Uh, asbestos is a material that was used in construction. Essentially, this is another thing that is breathed in. Uh, if you're exposed to this, it's used as an insulator. A lot of times, if you're doing home renovations on an older home, you may be exposed to asbestos uh, fibers during like demolition process of a home. And uh, if you inhale those fibers, they embed themselves in the lung tissues. Um, they're actually what's in the background there, so it's kind of a nasty thing to be breathing in. And um, they, they are linked to causing lung cancer. Volatile organic compounds is another one uh, found in building materials. This is those volatile things, those things that you that the smell it just hits you right in the head when you walk into a room. Things like a glue, a formaldehyde the smell of gasoline, um, adhesives on carpets, those kind of things that just hit you right away, those are the volatile organic compounds that we, we talk about. Um, other natural indoor air pollutants are things that are present in the environment but still can work their way into homes um, because we build in an area that has a soil structure or uranium uh, rocks in the soil that can seep natural radioactive gas into your homes. This happens typically through the basement structures or waterways, sorry, groundwater, um, and this is a known carcinogen to cause lung cancer as well. Uh, one of the other substances here, CFCs, um, this is our chlorofluorocarbons. We'll discuss a little later in a lot more detail. But ultimately, it's a greenhouse gas from refrigerants, and um, it, it was banned in the 80s through the Montreal Protocol, but uh, I put in the indoor air pollutant because it's something we bring inside, even though it clearly has a, a large impact uh, outdoors in the stratospheric ozone. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, noise pollution. These are excessive, unwanted, disturbing noise. Uh, causes some physiological stress, maybe even hearing loss. Things from transportation industry uh, sources tend to, and construction tend to have um, problems with noise pollution. Uh, certainly this has impact on people. Uh, but can have problems, impacts on organisms as well, um, specifically, you know, migratory organisms, um, organisms that use sound to communicate with each other. So something like whales or bats um, would be highly impacted by uh, severe noise pollution. Moving on to ozone, this is a, a quick reminder of atmospheric structure here. So we have our troposphere and stratosphere. Uh, then we have mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, way up there, right? So a quick atmosphere review. Uh, troposphere is where we live. Stratosphere is the next layer up. Um, the stratosphere contains the ozone layer, which is right here. Um, the ozone layer's job is basically these O3 molecules. Each one of these is an oxygen, and they're all bonded together, so that makes ozone O3. And uh, the ozone layer um, basically blocks... Uh, UV lights, particularly the damaging UV light. So UVC is particularly bad, uh, and that gets blocked out, uh, which is critical because it allows most life to exist, and including things like really important things like producers are um, allowed to thrive and flourish here. UVB, uh, about 1%, uh, I think it was like 1 to 2 percent of this ends up here. Okay, the rest is blocked out, and then uh, UVA. Uh, most of this goes through. You can see the arrows about the same. This is all, all in. All right. Uh, so the UVA um, can get through. The ozone layer doesn't do that. Ultimately, um, ultraviolet light. We want this blocked as much as possible. The stuff that isn't blocked, we you know tend to put sunscreen on for for protection of our skin cells. 
um, because it can cause sunburn, skin cancer. So that's the stuff that does get through. Um, so if we didn't have an ozone layer, now we would start getting some of this UVC through um, the ozone layer, which would be a big problem for living things. Um, what happens if we're exposed to a lot of UV light in addition to sunburn and skin cancer? Uh, it can cause cataracts in the eyes. It can reduce photosynthesis. Um, if the zooplankton have less energy from the phytoplankton, then the food chain suffers, and the overall ecosystem productivity can go down. So we want to prevent that from happening uh, in our ecosystems by having a nice, healthy ozone layer. So where does the ozone come from and what makes it go away? So we have a healthy ozone layer. In the background, you can see that this uh, blue area is a depleted ozone layer in the stratosphere. And it's located over the poles, typically, is where we see these, these holes occur. Um, ozone formation is a natural process, and ozone depletion can be a natural process. So we'll talk about the unnatural way um, in, in the next slide. Ozone formation, basically ultraviolet light, UVC rays, are going to break apart diatomic oxygen. You can see this over here. If you watch, here's our, our O2 coming in on this side. And then the O3 molecule is created over here. O2, O3, O2. I'll put my O3 right there. There it goes. So O3 goes that way. The O2 went there. And basically the oxygen splits, and then another one will pick it right up. So this occurs all the time for formation, uh, ozone formation. Our uh, free oxygen is going to bond to that, and that's how we end up with the O3. Uh, natural ozone depletion, basically these UVC rays, uh, can break the bonds between the ozone and leave a free oxygen. So that's where that other free oxygen came from. And they continue to kind of go through this, this natural cycle, this replenishable natural cycle back and forth, essentially, that you're looking at uh, over here. Ozone can also be broken down in Antarctic Spring. So this is one of those natural cycles that we observe uh, that in Antarctic Spring, melting ice crystals um, on the South Pole there basically can release... Uh, chlorine nitrates and some hydrochloric acid, which reacts and gives off a chlorine uh, that can pull oxygens away from ozone molecules too. So these polar stratospheric clouds or ice crystals, we can call them, basically here's your chlorine nitrate and your hydrochloric acid, and then a chlorine comes off of that and that can interact with ozone and cause uh, a thinning of ozone layer or reduction of ozone molecules in the atmosphere at that point in time. And this is all completely the natural process. So what's the problem? Well, what was the problem is we created this molecule, these CFCs, these chlor chlorinated um, carbons, basically. So it's a chlorofluorocarbon. And the CFC molecule that was in refrigerants um, has a, this, these chlorines on it. And these chlorines are reactive, and they want to basically uh, bond with anything they can. And in doing so, what happens is uh, UV light, you'll see in this diagram, we'll be drawing it here, this UV light comes in, and it's going to break one of these green chlorines off. The chlorine jumps over to an ozone, rips an oxygen away, leaves an O2 behind, and then makes this chlorine monoxide. The chlorine monoxide will then go bump into another oxygen and interact with that. So here's our chlorine monoxide and leaving the oxygen. Here's a free oxygen. The oxygens go together and leave behind a chlorine. So this process, while it's on a loop, can continue to happen over and over again. And this one chlorine can destroy as much as 100,000 ozone molecules just doing this process over and over and over again. All right. So this halogen, this halogen, um, any other halogenated gas would do this too. Uh, but this is our most famous uh, example.